Amen. Well, good morning. You know, this summer I took my family on an epic journey. This is something none of the five of us had ever done before, and maybe you have gone on this journey, and if you have, you'll know what it was like. We took the epic journey, the five of us, to Disney World. We took a week-long Disney World vacation, and it was awesome and fun, and being a researcher, I took about a month before we went, and I looked up all the blogs, watched all the YouTube videos. I found every article that said something like, the secrets to success at Disney World, how to have a successful Disney World vacation. And I had a note on my phone, like three pages long, like, don't go to this ride early, go to this ride late, skip that restaurant, but go to this restaurant, but not for lunch, only for dinner. This is the good Pandora ride, that is the bad Pandora ride. There was all kinds of things that I had researched, and we didn't get to do every single one, but I think we had a pretty darn good, successful Disney World vacation. And I thought I would share with you my personal four secrets to Disney World success. So if you have ever, if you're planning on going to Disney World, these are real quick, Nick's four secrets to Disney World success. And the first one is have a pre-fireworks pep talk. With your kids, have a pre-fireworks pep talk. Before, because, yeah, it was pretty awesome. Um, I just recommend, before this happens, sit down with your kids and tell them, this is supposed to happen. <laughs> because this was, by far, the most intense fireworks display I've ever seen. There are, like, regular fireworks, and then there are, like, Disney World fireworks. And for whatever reason, the place we were at our first day in the park, there were literally fireworks coming from everywhere. It was like, yeah, the whole sky was full of smoke. And I did not anticipate my children being concerned that Disney World was burning down. <laughs> so you might want to make sure they know before you go. Number two, limit your weapon purchases. Limit your weapon purchases. See, my son fell in love with this wooden samurai sword that we bought for him, and man, he was so excited about this thing. Here's a picture of him with this wooden samurai sword. It was totally awesome. You know, every kid he passed in the park was like, where did you get that? Where'd you go? And he's like, I bought it at Epcot. And they were like, mom, can we go to Epcot? And, um, you know, we knew it might be a risk getting it home on the airline, but I told my wife, don't worry about it. It'll be fine famous last words. <laughs> Just listen to your wife. But sure enough, we got through the airport all the way up to the front of the hour-long security line to the place where you put your bags in, and they said, I'm sorry, sir. You cannot travel with this. And my son was, was heartbroken. But great, thankfully, I was able to take the sword, run back to the very entrance of the airport, and some kind people were able to check that with our checked baggage and send it, and it was waiting for us when we got home as to San Diego. Thank you, Jesus. My next, my next um, secret to Disney World success is heed the signs. Read the signs and heed the signs. See, um, on our last day there, I wanted to go on a really cool last ride. And we were at the Disney's Animal Kingdom Park. And we saw this cool dinosaur ride. And all of my kids met the height requirement, you know, and there was a little sign that said, this can be kind of scary for youngsters. And my wife said, you know, maybe we should skip this ride. And I said, no, it's going to be great. You know, let's go. This is our last one. It's going to be really cool. And she said, oh, I think we'll sit this one out. So my wife and my daughter sat out the ride. And I um, took my two sons on the dinosaur. I thought, you know, this is a dinosaur ride. How scary can it be, right? They're just dinosaurs. Can I tell you? It was horrifying. <laughs> Who has ever been on the dinosaur ride at Animal Kingdom? Ho Am I lying? It's horrifying. Horrifying. The only purpose of this ride is to terrify you. I'm absolutely sure. And the entire time we're on the ride, I was like, I'm so sorry. Boys, I'm so, I'm so sorry. This is the worst three minutes of our life. Here's a picture of us on the dinosaur ride. <laughs> Abject terror. Look. Abject terror. That's what it looks like. Happy vacation, sons. Now you're going to get eaten. <laughs> but it's okay. We got off the ride. My, we got off the ride, and they told me, Dad, we weren't scared the whole time. I was like, really? I was terrified. So we took this picture, and we sent it. That's us being scared, but still having fun. <laughs> and lastly, my last, my last secret to Disney World success is beat the heat. Now, I do not like being hot. 
I'm sorry, but I do not like being hot. And I had done some research. I knew it was going to be 95 with like 200% humidity. And I went a little bit overboard in my purchases and my attempt to keep my family cool. Each one of us had a, a personal spray fan. You can show the picture of us. Each of us, you can see in, in their hands. They each had a personal spray fan and a cooling towel to wrap around their heads. Plus, I ordered a special soaking hat, an easy freeze gel pack for my neck, and double battery powered fans for my face that lit up at night. <laughs> I think I looked a little weird. <laughs> we got it and we opened the package and my wife goes, you're not actually going to wear that, are you? And I said, did you know it lights up? <laughs> You know what? I did wear it, and I was able to successfully stay kind of cool, and I shared the fans and the gel pack with my kids as well. But um, those are my secrets to Disney World success, so be, feel free to take those and share them with whoever you want. And you know, today I'd like to share with you God's secrets for success, not just for Disney World, but for the real world, because God has a secret to success that he has shared with his people and that he's put on my heart to share with you today. And God's secret for success is a lot simpler and a lot more powerful than my secrets to Disney World success. And I would like to look at the story of a man in the Bible whose life exemplifies God's secret to success. This is the man Joshua. We pick up his story in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever, wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I've given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. Sounds good. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instruction Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them to either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually, meditate it on it day and night, so that you will be sure to obey everything written in, in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. See, the book of Joshua is a book of success. Very few books and very few characters in the Bible are as successful as Joshua. He never turns away from God. He never gets disobedient. Throughout his entire life, he's just um, destroying the enemy, winning battle after battle after battle. He waged war for decades. You know how many battles he ever lost? One. In his whole life, he only ever lost one battle. And that's actually very unusual in the Bible. And look at some of the things that God promised Joshua in this, in this passage. He says, I promise you, wherever you set your foot, I've given it to you. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you. I won't abandon you. You will be successful in everything you do. You will prosper and succeed in all you do. And now if you had a paper Bible, I'd tell you to flip all the way back to the very end of the book of Joshua and read at the very end of Joshua's life. This is something he says right before he dies. These are some of the very first words in Joshua. Now here are some of the very last words in the book of Joshua. Joshua says, soon I will die, going the way of everything on earth. And deep in your hearts, you know, he's speaking to the people of God, the people he's led for these so many years. Deep in your hearts, you know that every promise of the Lord, your God, has come true. Not a single one has failed. Wow. I would like that to be my story, that at the end of my life, I look back over my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and the people that I've led and influenced and say, you know deep in your hearts that not one promise of God has failed. And what I've put my hand to do and what God's called me to do, I have been successful in everything that God's called me to do. Dear God, that that would be our confession at the end of our life as believers, as people of God, and as a church, city church in San Diego. Wow, I want that to be my story. So what was the secret 
to this kind of success. And I believe we see the secret right here at the beginning. God comes and reveals to Joshua his secret to success. Let's look again at verses seven and eight. It says, be careful to obey. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. Be sure to obey. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Do you see it? Obey then. Be sure to obey only then. And here is the principle we learn from Joshua's life. Success comes from obeying God. Success in your life, your marriage, your ministry, your finances, your future, success, the secret, is obeying God. Simple, but not always easy. God's secret to success is obedience. That's the title of my sermon today if you're taking notes. God's secret to success, obedience. I'd like to pray for you. God, I thank you for the fact that you're here and you make all this work. Oh God, we're so grateful for you. Grateful for your presence. Grateful for your word. Grateful for your correction. Grateful for your encouragement. And right now, as a people, we open our hearts. We make a decision to pull down any walls, any barriers in our hearts, and let your word have rich fulfillment, have its way in our hearts. Come and change us as only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We have two golden retrievers, and they are awesome dogs. Our dogs, they are awesome dogs. Okay. Um, they're about, <laughs> that was not planned. Our, um, they're about a year and a half, uh, and they're brothers. They're both boys, and they're fully grown, so they're huge, but they're not fully developed, so they're still playful. They run like figure eights in our yard. They wrestle and knock each other over and sometimes knock my children over, um, but We've trained them that at mealtime, we call them to the door, we set out their meal, and then I do this thing every day, and I love this. I open the door wide, and I call them, Henry Cooper, and they come to the door, and they sit perfectly still. And I say, sit, stay, and then I take like 10 steps back, and I stand there. And I've told my family, this is the most powerful 30 seconds of my day. <laughs> The beasts obey me. You know, I did it this morning and my six-year-old son goes, Dad, it's like the force. You're like a Jedi. I was like, I know. You hold out your hand and they stop. You remove your hand and they go. I said, I know. It's powerful, isn't it, son? But I love that moment, just those 30 seconds of holding my hand out and they can see the food and they're like, oh. and I can almost see the drool coming down and I'm like, stay. And they're like, okay, okay can we go? And then I say, go, you know, and they like run to their food and they gulp it all down and it's fun and it's funny. But the point is this, that there is a promised reward for my dogs that they can only get to through obedience. There is a promised reward God has for us. And the only way we can get to it is through obedience. He has a promised land, a place of success that he is trying to get you. And the only way to get there is through obedience. And the most incredible example of this in Joshua's life is this battle of Jericho, which is consequently the first battle he ever faces. Just a few chapters after God meets with him and he says, if you want to be successful, I'll give you the secret. I'll give you the secret. Obey me and everything you do, and I will make your way prosperous and successful. Only obey my words. A few chapters later, they're up against an impenetrable, impregnable fortress, a walled city that there was no way they could ever take down. And God meets with Joshua. Joshua falls on his face, says, what do you want me to do? And God gives him the battle instructions. And it's a little bit of an unusual battle plan. You saw it, so I'm not going to read it. But he tells him, for six days, I want you to mo just take a walk. Like, put your spears down, put your bows down, put your battering rams down. You just go, you take a walk. For six days, walk around the city. And then on the seventh day, walk around seven times. And at the end, you shout, and I will cause the walls to fall. And Joshua obeys 
to the letter. He does exactly what God asks him to do. As soon as he's asked to do it, he goes and he tells the people of God, here's what we're going to do. He didn't say like, how is that going to work? You know, have you seen the walls? (laughs) I've never heard of this battle strategy, God. No, he just obeys and he gives the plan to the people of God and they go and they do it for seven days. And on the seventh day, guess what happens? An incredible miracle, an incredible success that they never could have got on their own. But I want to pull out one little verse here. Before they fight the battle, before they walk around Jericho, God meets with Joshua and he says this. He says, the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua 6 verse 2, put Joshua 6 verse 2 up there, yeah. I have given you Jericho. This is before anything happened, before they walked around, before they goes, hey Joshua, here's what I want you to do. Take that city because behold, I have given it to you. Only God can do that. Right? Outside of time, he can tell you something he wants you to do in the past tense. You're going to do this. I've done it. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) I'm confused because you just asked me to do it. Is it done or not? And here's the point. In God's eyes, the battle was already won. Success was already guaranteed because Joshua responded with a heart of obedience. In God's eyes, the battle had already been finished just because Joshua was putting the principle of God's secret to success into motion. Back up a couple verses before this, before Joshua 6, 2. When God appears to Joshua, look at his response. God appears to Joshua, and the first thing he does is says he falls on the ground in reverence. And what does he say? He says, I am at your command. What do you want your servant to do? This is a man who is eager to obey the voice of God. What do you want your servant to do? And it says, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. I think it's so funny that the Bible includes the detail that the first commandment God gave Joshua in this passage is to take his shoes off. And it says, and Joshua did it. He meets with Joshua and he says, okay, what do you want me to do? He falls on his, on his face. Tell me. What, I'm at your command. Tell me what you want. He goes, okay, cool. Take off your shoes. He says, and Joshua did it. Why does the Bible include that detail? Because if we're faithful to obey in the small things, God knows he can trust you to bring you success in the big things. He knows if he can trust you with the shoes, he can trust you with Jericho. If he can trust you with a little bit of money, he can trust you with the riches of the kingdom of God. If he can trust you with a little bit of revelation, he can trust you with a lot. This is a principle all throughout the Bible because God doesn't just talk to us about the incredible, miraculous things that he wants you to do later in life, although he will tell you that. He also is speaking to us every day, whispering in our ear things every day he wants us to change and do ways in which we can obey and respond to the voice of God. He challenges us to get to work on time, have a good attitude, go to bed a little earlier, send that encouraging text, change that song, maybe turn that movie off, don't eat that extra portion, put your phone down for a little bit. Obedience in the small things leads to success in large things. God's secret to success is obedience. Matthew chapter 25 says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you now over much. And I heard a story of a man who once was in a worship service and he felt like God told him to give a certain person all the money that was in his wallet. So he checked his wallet and all he had was $5. And so he wrestled and he was like, that's going to kind of be an insult. I think like, the Lord told me to give this to you. You know, be blessed. Five dollars. So he wrestled the whole service long. At the end of the service, he's like, okay, fine. Gets out his wallet, takes the five dollars, gives it to the woman. The woman begins to cry. And she says, you know what? I'm a single mom and I don't have enough gas to get home. And I was just standing here praying and asking God, could you please give me enough money to get home so that I can have gas to get to my house? And he thought, wow, wow. See, God is always speaking to us. Maybe you're in a situation, you feel something's not right in your heart. There's an impression or a prompting. Don't ignore it. God's trying to get you to a place of success. Sometimes we override it or we overanalyze it. Like, that can't be God. Get behind me, Satan. God wouldn't ask me to do that. That's a little bit uncomfortable. God doesn't like it when we're uncomfortable, right? Thou says the Lord, thou shalt always be comfortable. 
It's actually kind of the opposite. <laughs> That's why the journey with Jesus is so exciting. It's not always comfortable, but it's exciting. And you know, the story, he goes on to tell a story of years later where the exact same thing happened to him, where he felt again that he was supposed to give all the money in his wallet to someone else. But this time he checked his wallet and he had a $100 bill. And he says, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I actually didn't do it that time. It was a $100 bill and I thought, ugh, I don't think I can do it. And he says, to this day, he wonders, what miracle did I miss out on? What incredible thing was God going to do for that person? And what incredible success was he going to bring to me through that place of obedience? Hearing that story caused me to remember the times when I have heard God's voice and either chose to ignore it or choose, chose to say no. But God's so gracious. He's the God of the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth chance. Amen? And he's speaking to you today. So how did Joshua get this kind of spirit? How did he become that person with such instant and powerful obedience? Because obedience does not come naturally. Any of y'all have kids? Can you testify? Obedience is not a natural frame of mind. Obedience must be learned. It has to be learned. And the quickest way to learn obedience to God is to practice with people. I'm going to say that again. The quickest way to develop a heart of obedience to God is to practice with people. And here, I think, is the key to Joshua's heart of obedience. We see that Joshua, since he was a young man, was Moses' personal assistant. It says in Numbers chapter 11, then Joshua, the son of Nun, the personal servant of Moses from his youth. And even in this verse, he says he responds, my Lord, my Lord, Moses, he calls his, he calls his, uh, his boss Lord. That's a pretty good personal servant. My Lord. <laughs> And you know, I bet Joshua didn't know when he said yes to being the personal servant of Moses that he was really saying yes to his future. That that heart of obedience that he would develop in being the personal servant to someone else would enable him to have incredible success later on in life. Because there were probably a lot of yeses in Joshua's life. Joshua, go clean the camels. Joshua, go get the manna. Joshua, fluff my pillow. Joshua, count the Israelites. Joshua, go check out the Red Sea. Make sure we can go across it. Joshua, how many sheep do we have? Yes, Moses, right? There's a lot of yeses. Absolutely, Moses. Whatever you say, Moses. Sure, Moses. And I'm sure that might have felt insignificant to Joshua. It could have felt beneath him, but God was using this lowly position to prepare Joshua's heart to have a heart of instant obedience so that when God spoke to him, he can handle the success God was taking him into. Now, if you don't get anything else I'm going to say today, get this verse. And I... I I'll just preface this verse with the fact that I don't fully understand this verse. I don't understand the theology of this verse, but it's in the Bible, so I'm going to read it. Hebrews 5.8 says, even Jesus, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience. Jesus, fully God, omnipotent, with all knowledge, learned obedience. And I can't explain that to you other than the fact that if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Come on, SDCLC students. It's time for some of us to learn obedience and see what God has in store through a heart that is yielded to the voice of God. You don't know what God is preparing you for through a season of saying yes that feels insignificant. He is preparing you for great things. It's something we need to learn. And it takes courage sometimes to obey. When I don't like it, when it doesn't make sense, when it's hard, when it's uncomfortable, when it seems insignificant, when it doesn't look like it's changing, that's when you are set up for success. See, because many of us begin serving God, and it's like it was with me. I was so excited for the first few months after I rededicated to Jesus. Wow, there's hope. Wow, there's freedom. Wow, there's promises. Wow, there's joy. I never knew life could be like this. This is awesome. I never knew the Bible said this. I started coming to City Church, and my life began to change. And for a few months, everything was rosy until God asked me to do something hard. And maybe you're at that place where everything was good and then all of a sudden you come up to a place where God asks you to do something hard. I'll come to church, but I'm not going to join one of those groups. 
That's not for me. I believe the Bible, but I don't know about this tithing thing. God needs to keep his hands off my money. Some of us hearing God in the pit of our hearts tell someone about that struggle. Call that person and ask them to forgive you. Miss a meal and fast every now and again. See, many great leaders in the Bible had its success up until a point. We could go through them, David, Solomon, others. And that point was the point in which they stopped saying yes to God. They stopped obeying God. I've trusted you up till now, but this is too big. Dear God, let us never come to that place. If God can be trusted with the small things, he can be trusted with the big things. And I remember when my wife and I were looking for our first house. We were so excited, and I got a little bit, we'll say focused. <laughs> Some might say obsessive. But I was on the MLS every moment of every day, staying up late. Did you see this house? Categorizing them, keeping them. These are just outside of our price range. These ones just came on the market. This is a foreclosure, so I'm not sure about that. And I'd sending them to our realtor and sending them to my wife. And about a few weeks into it, God was like, stop it. <laughs> you ever felt that? <laughs> stop it. And he told me something. He said, you're not going to be the one that finds it. I was like, are you sure? Because I'm really good at this. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sad to say that for several months, I disobeyed. I would stop for a few days, and then I'd go back, and I'd start researching again. I'd start catching, and I'd start. Anybody ever do that? Feel like God's told you something, and you're like, oh, I believe for a few days, and then I'm back. And I'm telling you, I went back and forth, back and forth for months, and I, I'm, I'm sad to say I wasted a lot of time. God wasn't trying to hurt me. He was trying to save my time. So finally I did. I pulled back and I said, okay, that's great. And we know we had a great realtor. And uh, so I pulled back and I was like, all right, you know, I'm not going to research anymore. So months went by. We put a few offers in, nothing. Checked out a few houses, nothing looked great. Nothing, 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 nothing. We waited seven, eight, nine months. And then, no joke, on Christmas Eve, our realtor calls us and says, guys, I found your house. So we go on Christmas Eve, put our offer in on Christmas Eve, gets accepted. We move in on Valentine's Day. And now here are some crazy things. Can I tell you this? We bought our home in um, the beginning of 2009, which if you look at the last 30 years of housing prices, is the ultimate bottom of housing prices. We could never have done that. Not just that. Because we delayed nine months, we went into a new year, and a brand new first-time homebuyer tax credit of multiple thousands of dollars became available that would not have been available when I had, if, I had, if we had bought a house earlier the, the year before. Not, not just that. You know, it wasn't even on the MLS. I wouldn't have been able to find it. She was told about the property by another realtor. See, that's the kind of success we're after. It's the God kind of success. It's nothing we could ever conjure up in ourselves. And the only way we get there is through obedience. It didn't make sense to stop looking. It didn't make sense. It felt like it was taking longer. But in fact, God had a plan for it. And I think the interesting thing about God's plan for Jericho he tells Joshua, okay, take six days, walk around one time a day, and then on the seventh day, walk around seven times. God could have done it in one day, yeah. right? He could have done it in one day. The plan could have been, Joshua, go walk around one time, shout, and I'll make the walls fall. So why did God bake in a season of waiting? Why was part waiting part of the plan? Because something happens in our hearts when we continue to choose obedience over and over and over again. What did God say to you? Say it over and over. You see, because God said it one time to the Israelites, but for seven days they had to remember. They went out and they walked around the wall. Nothing looked like it was changing. There's no cracks. There's no weakness. I'm sure it was easy on day four to wake up and be like, okay, you know, we've done this for four days. Cool. But what did God say? They had to choose obedience again and again and again. Maybe you feel like you're that, at that place. I'm moving, but nothing's really changing. Their success was found in continuing to obey. Feels like I'm walking in circles and this isn't working. Keep saying yes. Hebrews 10.36 says this, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue 
to obey. Continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all he has promised. When I was 20 years old, I was head over heels in love. I was absolutely in love with a girl that I had been dating for two years. And we weren't engaged yet, but we were talking about it. I remember going out and dancing under a bunch of trees one time. She goes, do you think we're going to get married? And I said, gosh, I hope so. <laughs> and we laughed. We were planning our future, dreaming about what God had for us. And around that same time, when I was about 20 years old, both of us started coming to City Church. And man, got a hold, got a hold of our lives in a huge way. Oh man, things began to change in her life and in my life. How God and only he can do, things began to get better and change and it was exciting. But like I said earlier, a few months in, I felt in my heart that God was asking me to do something hard. See, I would go to prayer and I would get this thought, you should break up with your girlfriend so you can give your heart fully to me. And I was like, that's a weird thought. We love each other. Weird. <laughs> then I go back to prayer the next day. You should break up with your girlfriend so you can be pure hearted, solely running after me. I thought, gosh, she's not going to understand. <laughs> you know how that conversation is going to go? Like, God told us, God told me to have us break up. Like, okay, great, you know? I thought we were talking about getting married. And I waited a week, two weeks, three weeks. I waited a whole month, wrestling, wrestling in the pit of my stomach. What am I going to do? And finally, I got up the courage to obey God. And I was at an out-of-state college, so I actually had to call her. And on the phone, I remember like, oh, dear God, help me. I said, you know, I got something hard I want to talk to you about. And she goes, what is it? I said, I feel like God's asking us to break up. And I waited. She waited. And she said this. Yeah, he told me that a month ago. <laughs> and that took my breath away. And at that moment, we had a choice. We knew it was God. And there's things in your life you say, I know I'm supposed to do this. I know I'm supposed to call that person. I know I'm supposed to step out in obedience to God in this thing. Those I knows in your life, it's the voice of God. I knew, we knew at that point. We didn't want to do it, honestly. We were in love. It was awesome. I love this girl. And we decided, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to break up. We're not going to promise anything, and we're going to both run hard after God. And she had been going through the same thing for the whole month prior. So I was a little extreme. You know, I took her pictures, and I took all the notes, and I took all the things, and I stuffed them while I was crying. And I stuffed them in the bottom of a box, put a bunch of stuff on it, put the box at the bottom of my closet. Um, I'd like to tell you, five, six months later, we got back together. Um, but it was not one not two, not three, but four years. We were broken up for four difficult, hard, testing years of misunderstanding, broken hopes, promises. We'd see each other and it'd be like, uh, you know. It was weird. It was hard. There are journal entries from those four years that we don't want anybody to read. But I'll tell you the end of the story. Me and that girl last week celebrated 13 years, our wedding anniversary of 13 years. She's sitting on the front row. And I want to just put up a picture. This is my wife and kids, and 20-year-old Nick did not know that this was the success that was just on the other side of that obedience. I couldn't see it, but God could see it. And he was trying to tell me, if only you'll obey me. Look at the success that I'll bring you into because I'm sorry, but the joy and the success that we have in our marriage right now, I'm flabbergasted every day at the woman that God created in those four years and gave back to me. I wouldn't trade those four years for anything. City Church, you don't know what God is going to do through one act of obedience. You don't know the success that he wants to get into you through his secret to success, which is obedience. I'd like to pray for you if you'd all close your eyes. I'd like to pray.